Hello everyone and welcome back finally for another tutorial. For those of you who don't follow me on Instagram, I broke my wrist 12 weeks ago uh, and now I've been cleared to sort of start moving it and doing all my normal activities again and I'm feeling up to finally editing a video. This video here is me painting up the battle mechs of the 4th Deneb Light Cavalry. It's a counterpart to a previous video on the 13th Donegal Guards. Link is in the card if you do want to watch that one. Uh, and the footage was taken while I was painting these guys and recovering from my broken wrist. So I don't have full footage for everything, but I, I've worked with what I've got here and I should have a pretty good video for you. So we're going to start here with basing, priming, and applying battle damage to the models. This footage isn't from the battle mechs that I used for painting the 4th Deneb Light Cavalry, because that's some of the footage that I didn't actually take while I was working with the broken wrist. But I'm going to use the footage from the previous video, all the principles are the same, it's just a different chassis. So for my basing, I use cat litter, baking soda, and super glue, that's any cyanoacrylate glue. The reason I use that is because super glue or cyanoacrylate glues react with baking soda. Baking soda serves as a catalyst, it helps them cure faster, and it sets up inside them to make a really solid sort of bond that has a sort of sandy texture. Some of you might use sand, like actual sand, to make the bases of your models. That's cool too. Um, I just use the baking soda because it has a finer grain. Uh, sand looks larger, like gravel, like larger rocks with uh, models of this size. S super glue and baking soda makes a finer sort of sand texture. The cat litter, as you can see, is applied kind of sparingly there. It just serves to be larger pebbles and break up the sort of ground cover. I just put on maybe a little pinch and sort of shake it unevenly over the base. Then I apply the baking soda afterwards because, as I mentioned, it serves as a catalyst, it sets up the glue, and it holds everything in place. If your models aren't pre-based like these battle mechs are, then this is really useful as well to hold them in place. For priming, I go in with an airbrush and I apply Vallejo Surface Primer Black, and then I apply some white ink from above. What this does is it gives me a zenithal highlight, the zenith being the point directly above an object. A zenithal highlight is a highlight from above that makes things look pre-lit. It gives sort of a cheap shading that I can use as a guide when I'm painting to identify what the lighted areas should be and what the shaded areas should be. This is Citadel Agrellan Earth. I'm going to be using this for the battle damage. It's sort of a technical paint from Games Workshop. I don't really use a lot of their paints, but this one's really cool. It crackles up as it dries and gives, a, yeah, a craggly texture. I'm going to use that. I'm going to apply it both around the feet of the battle mechs, making it look that they're sort of driving into the ground with their great weight, you know, to sort of imply that mass that battle mechs have. I mean, these are upwards of 50 tons in some cases, so they should be quite heavy. I'm also going to be applying it to locations that I think are likely to take fire when the battle mechs are in combat to simulate the armor being cracked and pierced by incoming gunfire or laser fire or missiles or whatever they're shooting at each other with in that particular case. Since the 13th Donegal Guards and the 4th Deneb Light Cavalry actually fight each other nearly to annihilation within the Battletech storyline, I wanted these guys to look damaged and look beat up like they're part of that big climactic battle. By applying it in little circle areas to imply craters where something would have struck directly on the armor, and linear areas to show sort of grooves where a round might have scraped along the armor, I'm trying to just give some character to it. Once I've applied the Agrellan Earth and I've let it dry just a little bit, I go in with a sharp implement, in this case this is a clay sculpting tool, and I'm just going to poke out the centers of the big globs that I've applied. Agrellan Earth only crackles where it's thick, so leave it thick on the edges and thin it out in the middle to get a crater shape. Now I'm going to start base coating the miniatures, and we're going to start using the actual miniatures that I'm working with to make the 4th Deneb Light Cavalry. The 4th Deneb Light Cavalry are kind of interesting because unlike a lot of other units in Battletech and in popular sci-fi franchises, they don't use bright colors for their camouflage or for their parade uniform or anything. They use tan. As a result, of course, I'm going to be painting these guys tan. I don't have tan paint, however, so I'm going to use this brown cheap acrylic paint and some brown India ink, and I'm going to mix those together on my palette. I think I'm saying that right now, uh, to make a relatively thin but still very colorful brownish base. I base coat my miniatures with the color that should apply in their shaded areas and I'm going to work my way up to the highlights from here. By using ink to thin out my paints instead of water, well A, I've got a little bit of water getting in there already because I use a wet palette, uh, and B, the ink has pigment in it so it's going to keep the colors really rich even though I'm thinning them. Then I get a thinner texture but still a rich color. With that brown applied all over the miniature, I can start on that highlighting process, starting by adding a little bit of yellow acrylic paint to my palette. I'm going to mix all that together 
and I'm going to be getting a tan. But I'm gonna be doing that by creating a bit of a gradient so that I know what my darkest color is and what my lightest color is, and I can sort of work from bottom to top as I work my way forward. I'm again using ink here as a thinning agent to help thin out the color without thinning out the color, if that makes sense. I want the colors to still be vibrant, but I want the consistency of the paint to be thin and relatively runny so it's easy to apply and so that you can see the previous colors through it slightly, thereby giving me a sort of blend from the dark areas to the light areas. This blend only gets smoother the more layers you put on, but in this case I'm recovering from my wrist and I've only got such you know, only so much eyesight to work with anyway. So I'm gonna be working with about three layers from the dark brown in the shadows up to the light brown I'm gonna use to highlight the edges of panels on the battle mech. Here on my palette, I'm giving an example of what I do in order to create that gradient I was talking about. And it helps me just sort of swatch out my colors and make sure that they're all gonna follow one from the other so they're not completely distinct. You know, if you take colors from two different bottles and you apply them and one's got a warm sort of feel and one's got a cool sort of feel, you might not get as good a gradient from your shadows to highlights as you might be able to achieve if you create that gradient yourself. When I'm applying the colors to the models themselves, I'm gonna stick to the tops of the panels here. This brown that I put on over top of everything went down into the shadowed crevices between the panels, uh, and I'm going to be working basically only on the panels from now on. The reason for this, mainly, is that battle mechs don't have a lot of detail in their paint scheme necessarily. There's a lot you can do to put on designs and camouflage and stuff like that, but if you want to keep a relatively clean paint job, in this case the tan of the 4th Denoblite Cavalry, while still having it be interesting, you need to emphasize that texture. This is what the model looks like after just applying the first sort of thin layer of slightly yellow or brown. And you can see it's just made all of the panels a little more vibrant. They pop out from the areas where there was um, just the brown. And we're going to go in again with another similar layer. I'm doing this in thin coats, um, thinned with the ink again, just so that things are easy to apply, but I'm not so thin that it's going to flow into the crevices. I'm not applying a wash here. I don't want the crevices themselves to get lighter. I want the tops of the panels to get lighter. And I just want to keep that really sort of welded together look of all of the panels. Keeping to the higher areas, I'm also going to highlight a round battle damage. In this case, you can see three auto cannon rounds that went across the top of the, uh, the head of the catapult, as it were. So I'm just picking out the edges of those and leaving the center of them dark. We're going to pick out the center of those with a different color later, just to make them look even more like battle damage and not just like a shadow in the brown but that's for later. For now, just stick to the high levels of any of your panels and just keep panel highlighting your way forward until you get something that's a little more striking. At the end of that coat, once things have dried, it looks a little like this. Acrylic paint always dries a little darker than you think it will, so keep that in mind. You know, you may think that you're applying something really bright, but it's probably gonna tone down a little bit. It takes a little bit of pushing and pulling and getting used to, but it's actually a pretty cool effect. It means you can work with things that are a little more vibrant than you thought you should. At this point now, I'm going to start highlighting again with an even lighter color, but I'm going to start sticking to the top edges of every panel. I'm imagining that the light is hitting this battle mech from the top right, sort of where the camera is looking at it right now, so I keep looking at it from there and seeing what I can see, and the nearest edges of any panel to me, when I'm looking at it from the direction that I imagine the light to be coming from, are the edges that should be the brightest, because they're closest to the light. And that's what I use. If something's facing the light, or if something's near to the light, I pick it out just very lightly with a smallish paintbrush with this lighter color. Which is, you can already see a little bit on the side of the catapult's head here, is already drying a little darker, and it's making just a little bit of dimension on these panels. Again, it's not like some you know, fantasy character covered in belts and cloaks and capes and whatever that uh, you can use the cloth and just highlight the high edges of the cloth and get a lot of texture out of it. With this battle mech, every texture is kind of just a flat panel of metal that should be relatively matte, especially if it's camouflaged. <laughs> These shouldn't be super glossy, they shouldn't be super crazy, at least not in my mind, so this is a kind of finesse thing. And you want to make sure that it looks good. So a lot of these steps, they may seem really subtle, especially work with browns, which are not particularly striking colors. So I made sure to keep one of the models not painted while I painted up this one. Um, and I can sort of show you the difference. So that's the catapult with the highlights on the edges applied and the little bit of working up from the shadow. And this is the Wolverine with just the brown that was applied at first, just the base coat. 
And yeah, it's kind of flat. It's kind of eh, whatever. It's also not the tan color I was looking for for the, the fourth Den of Light Cavalry, but in general, it's just not got all that much dimension. Whereas this edge highlighting immediately makes the model pop on the tabletop. And that's it. That's a few layers of brown working towards a yellow. And we've gotten ourselves a battle mech that is honestly already presentable. Now it's details. And the first details I'm going to start with are gray ones. I'm going to do the same thing here again. I'm going to mix some ink and I'm going to mix some acrylic paint. I'm mixing this black ink with the white acrylic paint that I had on my palette from earlier. And I'm again going to make a gradient of grays. Every one of my colors is going to be gradiented from a dark shadow up to a lighter highlight just to give every little part of the model a little more dimension, a little more depth. If you do want to know how I made this palette, by the way, I have a video on this channel under the heading Let's Get Technical about how I made this exact wet palette out of parts that you can buy at the dollar store. So hopefully that can help some of you who are looking at wet palettes or considering the idea um, make one that is totally functional and does keep my paints still workable for long periods of time. That's especially helpful with projects like this where I've mixed my own tan and uh, if I were trying to do multiple battle mechs, in this case five battle mechs, uh, and I couldn't do it all in one sitting, I would have to remix that tan every time and it would be very, very hard to make a consistent color. Getting back to the gray though, I'm working from a dark to a light, but I'm not working straight to white. I don't want the gray to look like it's metallic shiny. I want the gray to look like it's still kind of matte. You know, it's not reflecting bright white sunlight back at you, but it's reflecting just a little bit. It's a little bit brighter on the side of the sun. That's all. So going in first off with the dark shadow gray color. Over all of the gray areas, I'm going to be specifying things like vents, weapon barrels, uh, joints. All of these are going to be gray for me. Whereas all of the main panels, which we've already painted, are going to be that tan color. The battle damage is also going to get the gray treatment to sort of imply that it's hit something metallic underneath or maybe the primer, if the primer of this particular uh, vehicle is gray, for example, just something underneath that is a different color. It'll make them stand out more than the brown shaded color, since the brown shaded color specifically is meant to be just a shadow color that sort of our eyes will look over, but just acknowledge as a detail. So all of the damage is also going to get this gray treatment. Be a little careful here, the uh, work that you've done, if you're following along at home that is, to keep everything you know, nice and tidy while you're highlighting it with the tan colors uh, would be pretty easy to undo if you just slathered some black on it. So, you know, the, the first little bit was a little rough and ready and now we're getting a little more precise, which was kind of the point while I was recovering from a broken wrist. Uh, it, it really worked out well. Here I'm going to paint the front of the missile launcher pods as well. This makes the weapons sort of stand out, which is something I like to do with all weapons. I mean, the weapons on a, you know, combat battle mech are quite important parts and you do want everyone's eyes to be sort of drawn to them. So this will help them pop out a little bit. It'll also help uh, later on when I paint the missiles warheads red for the missiles to stand out against it more than they would against brown, which is kind of a warmish color. This gray is quite cool. So there's a little bit more contrast there. One of the other little details that you're going to want to get to with the gray are the stones on the base. That's the cat litter that was put on earlier. Um, it's sort of just showing up. They're little mounds and they're little rocks sticking out through the sand. Pick them out with gray, that way they look a little bit better. They're mostly going to be covered up with flock later, but by painting them gray you give them a better chance to actually show through that sort of green flocking that we're putting on over top. Plus it'll just look really nice if someone looks closely and sees that there's a little bit of something underneath. Now I'm going to go in after everything's been covered with the dark gray and again I'm just going to start picking out raised areas with a mid-tone gray, sort of picking it out of the center of my gradient that I've made. In this case I know I'm only going to get shadow, mid-tone, and highlight because a lot of these areas are really really small and if I try making too much more of a gradient than that I'm going to have a very hard time. So I'm just going to go in very very lightly and I'm going to pick out sort of hmm, a third, two thirds of the um, areas that I'd already made dark or any of the very raised areas on grills like these or on any of the exhaust ports on the missile launchers. And I'm going to pick them out with that mid-tone. I'm going to do the same thing with the battle damage and then I'm going to go in with a lighter gray. Again, just covering a smaller area each time and each time focusing on the area that would be most likely to catch the light based on looking at it from where I've decided my light is coming from, the upper right. With all the gray areas covered, it's time to go on to the exciting part, the weapons. 
And of course, it wouldn't truly be exciting unless we started by reading a little bit. <laughs> I've pulled out the um, record sheets from the Battletech box, the game of Armored Combat, and I'm just looking at the weapons and where they're located, and I'm going to sort of infer uh, which ones are which. For the catapult, that's very, very easy, but for some battle mechs, you got to do a little more interpretation. In this case, it's four medium lasers under the cockpit there, and long-range missiles on either side. I'm going to be painting my medium lasers green in following with the video games, as I do play the video games, and that's what sort of jumps out at me. While I paint the warheads for the missiles red, because red equals explosive, I guess? It's just sort of a, a you know, feel thing. It looks nice or whatever. Once again, I'm going to be aiming to get a gradient. Uh, you're probably noticing a theme by now. I'm going to get a dark color with some green in it. I'm going to get a mid-tone green that's just mainly green. And then I'm going to get a light green with some white in it. These colors are going to be what I use to give a jeweling effect to the lenses of my medium lasers. By giving a little jeweling effect, I'm hoping to give it a little bit of detail, but honestly, these lasers are so small. Um, I, I don't even know how noticeable it really is in the end. For battle mechs with larger weapons though, you know, if you're thinking about the battle master who has a uh, really large particle projector cannon in the right hand, uh, that's a really big lens that can look very, very good if you jewel it. And in fact, I did that when I painted up my battle master as part of this batch. Um, and for a lot of other weapons, just adding some color on the end of them can be quite nice. Auto cannons, I don't do that. I just add some gray and black mixture, just like I did for all the gray details to imply a sort of deep, dark barrel extending into the miniature. While I mix up these paints, I'm just going to take a minute here and say thank you all for coming back to the channel and thank you all for subscribing. Um, hopefully I'm going to be putting out a lot more videos as time goes on. Uh, I've got some more stuff in the pipe. I've got a really big project coming up. Really exciting, really interesting. I think some of you will be interested as well. Um, and ideally, I'm going to be going up to about a video a month starting in 2021. Fingers crossed, I've got a little bit of a life situation change going on um, and we'll see how things go after that. The red here, I'm putting down some red ink. I'm going to be using that for the actual missile warheads, as I mentioned before. And I'm going to do the same thing, except I'm not going to go all the way to a very light white color, because I don't want, again, these to be shiny. When you're creating these gradients, try to think about where the lowest and highest points should be. The lowest point, in my opinion, should be just short of black, but never actually black, because that way, by having a little bit of the actual color mixed in, it looks quite nice underneath everything else, and it's sort of tied in in terms of tone. And the highest color should be closer to white if you're looking at a really glossy surface, something that's just straight up reflecting the sun's light back at you, and further away from white if you're looking at something that is more of a matte surface, a satin finish. In this case, my missiles, I'm going to assume they're not that glossy, so I'm going to make the highest highlight just a sort of bright red, not a white or a pale or color that, uh, that implies perfect shine. Keeping these sorts of things in mind can help your surfaces look different even though you're not actually covering them with particularly different paint. And can help you avoid using metallic paint for smallish areas. Um, I'm trying to move a little bit away from metallic paints just because I find it interesting to try and replicate the same effect without using the metallic paint. In hobby speak, I think that's called non-metal metal, except I haven't really gotten around to doing any of those really, really fancy non-metal metal, you know, full suit of armor, and you can see the scenery reflected in it sort of deals yet. Um, you know, one can dream, maybe soon. But for now, I'm just making, uh, I'm making an effort to make a differentiation in the texture of the different parts of my uh, miniatures, just through choice of color and choice of value, that sort of stuff, instead of through choice of paint. Mixing my paints has really made me feel like I've got more of a hold over how my thing's being painted and what the colors are as well. So once I've gone on with dark and then light red on the missiles, I'm going into the actual lasers onto their lenses and I'm applying the almost black but not quite mixed with green. And then I'm going to go in progressively with each color while it's still wet. Now for jeweling, this can be a really useful technique because by loading your brush with a lot of a liquid and then sort of just touching it into another liquid, it'll unload a little bit into the middle and everything will sort of flow together and blend a little bit and it can make a really nice sort of smooth gradient effect within a lens or a canopy or a screen or something like that. I'm going to do the same thing with the canopy of the battle neck, so the actual sort of windows around the cockpit, very very shortly here, and it'll be a lot easier to see what I'm doing. But basically here, going in with dark, black, almost black anyway, then going in with a green, 
then going in again with a light green, and then finally at the very end I'm going to get a brush with just the tiniest bit of white, and you can see I'm just going to put a little, little dot, little dot of white right on the edge, just, just for a little reflection of the sun on the edge of the lens. Without that dot of white, the color is so dark that really it's not all that visible, and with the dot of white, it looks mostly white from a distance. Like, here you go, boop, just that little, little boop, little boop. Um, just, yeah, just a little bit of white, uh, but even then, it looks mostly white from a distance, and if you didn't have it, it would look mostly like nothing. These uh, laser lenses are just tiny, they're not a great, uh, great exercise in lensing, at least uh, for me anyway, it doesn't seem that way. I'm sure there's some people out there who have them looking beautiful. But uh, I'm pretty happy with how it looks. It's one of those things where when you look close at the miniature, then you can see the black going to green, going to white. And it looks quite nice. It just doesn't, uh, doesn't convey on the tabletop all that much. Keeping the uh, very small amount of paint on the end of the brush here means that I, I need to use not thinned at all white acrylic paint as well. There's no, there's no thinning there. There's no white ink. There's no anything. It's just acrylic paint. So I can just get the smallest little bulb of it on the end of the paintbrush. Now painting the canopy for the model. I'm going to be doing it with an orange glow. I use an orange glow for a lot of my battle mechs. This is partly because in the books they describe the, the sort of HUD of the battle mechs as being a little golden color. And in the video games it's a golden sort of color as well, uh, yellowish, orangish. So I stick to an orange, but I do a really bright orange. It also pops really well. Very, very few of my battle mechs are or probably will be painted bright, you know, um, Cheeto orange, so having a bright orange canopy kind of stands out. Alternate ideas would be to pick something that is a contrast with your battle mech's paint color. This could include, for example, with my 13th Donegal Guards, the orange on blue, that looks really good. In this case, maybe I would have done a blue or a green as a canopy if I was looking for a contrast, but I'm pretty happy with the bright orange. So in this case, starting off here, I'm just putting in the dark, not quite black again, the blackish orange into all the slots just to moisten them all the way across make it all a wet surface that other colors are going to flow onto be very very careful here this is if you're going in with a very wet color like this and you've got all these crevices for it to flow into boy is it going to want to flow um i have a little bit of overflow here in a minute but uh i've loaded up my paintbrush here with more orange than black now and i'm just tapping it in the middle and you can see ooh, i'm adding so much fluid it's getting sort of bulgy um, don't do that. You want just enough to make it wet, but not enough that it's going to overflow its bounds. Go in now with the pure orange. Go in with the pure orange on the actual canopy, and this is where it sort of blew out the side of the nose and gave the, uh, the miniature a bit of a blush and ran into the cracks. Yeah, now he's a little bit of a kawaii catapult. <laughs> but we can correct that because, because, we've got a wet pellet. And the wet palette is keeping all of that tan from earlier still wet, so I have the same color and I don't have to color match or do anything crazy. I could just go back in and paint it over with some of the previous tan. Wow, that's a lifesaver, honestly. Um, I made it with parts from the dollar store. It's not like fantastic, and you can see there's wrinkles in it. There's some stuff to work around if you don't set it up perfectly, um, as I didn't in this particular case. But man, it's still useful, so go check out that other video. If you don't have a wet palette, do yourself a favor. Just, just make one. Just just get a couple sponges, get some parchment paper, go check out the other video. Yeah, I'll show you how to do it. <laughs> so, gonna go on to the wash now. Uh, this is not a wash like you might traditionally have seen, uh, with the wash just sort of being applied liberally over the entire battle mech. I don't want the battle mech to look dirty and muddy and wet and whatever. I, I don't like the, the marks left by other washes. So this is a mix of water, Vallejo Airbrush Flow Improver, and black ink with just a really small amount of black ink and then a small amount of brown ink in it as well to make it a warmer color. That makes it sort of blend better with most things including this brown here. Since this is a brown battle mech you know to have a perfectly black wash would be weird. I'm gonna have a very thin brush with long enough bristles that they can be charged with quite a bit of liquid. And I'm gonna charge this brush with that wash and I'm gonna just run it in the recesses. I'm gonna run it in the nooks and the crannies and I'm gonna make sure I don't overflow it and I don't get it on the panels. I like the clean look of these panels. They look good. They got that nice sort of highlighted look and I'm really proud of what I've done here. And I don't wanna ruin it by just slathering everything in a black wash that's gonna make everything look grim and dark and sad. And basically make me have to re-highlight it afterwards if I want it to pop again. I think technically this is called a pin wash, um, but I'm not sure if I'm doing exactly what people call a pin wash or if they actually use a pin. But I think it's like a pin wash because you're precise like a pin head. <laughs> anyway, I'm just applying it in the very 
very edges of things and this wash is so thin it's not really going to look all that different except it should just make all the lines look a little crisper it does for me anyway this was a lot of experimentation to get the consistency of wash i wanted uh which is to say yeah just enough that when it pools densely in cracks it looks quite good and when it's all over a surface you don't really notice it that much it's just a little glossier maybe the real secret in my opinion was putting a little bit of brown in with black just straight up black didn't look that great a little bit of brown warms it up makes it look a little dustier makes it look a little more lively like it's there's still sunlight getting in there you know there's still a little bit of yellow a little bit of warmth um and you can go in anywhere with this and you can just apply it on the edges i'm even going to put it at the bottom of the canopy here because that bright orange got a little too far down you know i want it to look like there's a console at the front of the cockpit that's shining back so it's brightest near the front but not right down at the edge where the um the actual console itself and the the stanchions inside the cockpit would block it off so I'm going to use my black wash and I'm going to go into all of the nooks, all the crannies, all the craters, and I'm just going to lay it in very, very carefully. With the wash done, I'm going to finalize off the base. The base of the miniature here, you know, we've already got a lot of detail on it. Honestly, if you wanted to, you could probably just leave it as it is with the brown paint from the base coat and then the gray from the, the rocks. You do want to pick out the rocks a little more if you're like me and you picked them out very darkly before. I'm just going to put a little more. This is an even lighter gray onto all of the rock's most raised surfaces, just so they pop out a little bit more through my flocking. You might not need to do this if you're not going to flock, you know, if you just want them to be in a desert or on soil or something. Uh, but in this case, like with flock coming in and everything, and I just want everything about this to be vibrant. I want it to pop. I want it to look colorful. I don't want it all to look like a muddy mess, which would be so easy to do when painting something whose main color is brown. Mod Podge. Mod Podge is a white glue, sort of, um, but I have tried cheap white glues and they leave a sort of foggy base or they leave, uh, it just, it doesn't look good. This Mod Podge matte, it dries clear, it dries gone, I, I don't have to worry about it, so I, I use Mod Podge for basing. Um, you may have better luck with whatever cheap craft glue is available near you, but the cheap craft glue that I got... Uh, yeah, it, it just didn't turn out well, so I looked for an alternative, but Mod Podge is an actual name brand product that uh, I stand by for this case. It also, if you have the matte Mod Podge, can be used for touching up your varnish after um, after varnishing if you do need to correct something. You just mix it in with a little bit of paint, it'll make the paint dry a little more matte than it would otherwise. Little tip for you. Now for the flock itself, this is a mixture of actual static grass flock, some little clump flock. I think there's some, maybe a little bit of oregano, maybe not, and definitely a lot of dill in there, because dill's got some nice natural colors and it's long and sticky outy, kind of like grass. And I'm just going to dab that on there, I'm going to try and sort of shake it all so it stands up a little bit. I don't want to tamp it down with my fingers and make it all look flat and sickly but i do want to tap on it just a little bit to make sure that it settles properly into the white glue because otherwise if it's not being held strongly in place then you might have some problems later at this point i apply a gloss varnish now the gloss varnish ah surprise that's because i'm going to be putting on decals and decals that's super exciting um water slide decals i applied some to my 13th dunny gal guards uh, i wanted to make that a video but uh, it really didn't turn out well because it was very very shortly after i broke my wrist so I'm doing it with this one. The gloss varnish applied through an airbrush in my case, but you might get a rattle can to do it, just makes a smooth surface that your decal, your water slide decal in this case, can stick to and actually grip the miniature. The decals in question are from Fighting Piranha Graphics. As far as I know, they're the only ones who make decals specific to Battletech. Uh, their surface was great, it was quick, they're pretty cheap, there's a lot of them on a sheet, and there's lots of different sizes. Because there's lots of different sizes, make sure you scout out which one you want before you apply it. I'm just going to hold this up next to my battle mech, decide where I want to put the decals, and pick the size I want. This one's going to be number two. I'm ordering them one through five in order of tonnage. So number one was the battle master, number two is the catapult, and so on. To get your decal off the sheet, use a sharp craft knife and cut close to the decal. Uh, you want to cut as close as you can without cutting off pieces of the decal because this means that you won't have any of that extra water slide paper sort of sticking out to the sides and making a weird square frame over it. And that way any extra water slide is very, very close to the numbers and is likely to be obscured by them. It does have a different texture. It's basically just sort of a plastic paper. So put it in some water and it'll just soak in the water and eventually the decal will separate from the paper backing. 
you might want to do this with a paintbrush, you might want to do it with uh, tweezers or some other device. Um, but otherwise, you, you could use your fingers as well. You're just going to have to push it off of the paper if it doesn't float off on its own. And then you need to collect it and bring it to the miniature. Before you do that, it can help to wet the miniature a little bit where you want to apply the decal. Um, then brush away the decal, gather it up. I'm using a paintbrush here, a pretty shaggy one that's not in great shape. But that means it's got a lot of bristles and it holds a lot of water. And I'm bringing over the decal on the paintbrush to the location I've already moistened. The water, as water slide decal implies, helps the water slide decal slide so that you can slide it into place. That's a terrible joke. Um, anyway, it, it slides around the decal and you can push it into place. And then once you're done getting it into place, use a Kleenex and soak away some of the water. Just dab it on there, push it around a little bit more if you have to, if, like me, you pushed it out of location. Uh, and then you can use that Kleenex or toilet paper or whatever to just wipe up the last of the... Or not wipe, don't wipe. You'll move the decal, dab off the last of the water. And then take it off to the side. And I'm going to just put a little bit of my very, very, very thin pin washing black-brown mix that I just used as the wash for the miniature over top of the decals. I'm going to be very, very careful with this because it is water-based, so it'll slide the decals if I'm not careful. And I don't want it to be so much that it makes the decals look so dirty they're illegible. I just want to take that bright, bright, bright white and bring it down a little bit because I don't have any bright, bright, bright white anywhere else other than like on the lenses, which is direct reflected sunlight. So that's too bright for the decals themselves. With matte varnish and a little bit of black paint around the edges of the base, some more stuff I didn't film, I apologize. You've got a finished miniature. Hey, there you go. Um, I used this method in parallel to paint five different battle mechs and that finished off my uh, beginner's box and game of armored combat box, giving me two full sets of five battle mechs from the 13th Denigal Guard and the 4th Denigal Light Cavalry that I can use to face off against each other. All right, thank you so much for tuning in for this latest video. It's been a while. I'm excited to get back to making videos. I uh, really appreciate those of you who are coming in and watching these things, and I hope it's helping you. I know the Clan Invasion Kickstarter just fulfilled for some people, so some people out there are probably looking for tutorials on how to paint battle mechs. If you're one of them, thanks for tuning in. I hope this helped you as well. Uh, I haven't gotten my Clan Invasion stuff because I'm waiting for Wave 2 when I should be getting all of the various accoutrements. And at that point, you can expect, hopefully, to see some more painting tutorials for clan uh, paint jobs on this channel. I do really, really, really love Battletech, so as more Battletech content comes, expect to see it on the channel. There's just only so much available right now. If you are interested in seeing a different unit done up, I do have some backlog battle mechs, the old metal pieces uh, that I could be using and painting up. Uh, if you've got any suggestions for other franchises, any stuff that you'd like painted, or any questions about what happened here, or even any comments on how I pronounce things, um, definitely leave them down in the comments. I read all the comments, and uh, I really appreciate seeing them. With all that being said, thanks again for watching, and uh, go play some games.